Hello everyone, this is y'all's lovely Vice President, Edward Timesian. Y'all know me for my published paper on the origin of evil and theistic art determinism. And pretty soon, publishing company Pootpa Prince is going to publish a bunch of essays. And one of, I, one of mine is going to be included and it'll be in book form, so y'all should check that out. That'll be coming out on the turn of 2025. And today, for the 16th time... I'm going to be doing an interview with the great and legendary Prince of the Christ myth theorist, Dr. Robert M. Price. And before we dive into the questions, I'll let him do his self-promoting and talk about whatever he feels like. So go ahead. Take it away, Dr. Robert M. Price. Well, uh, believe it or not, being a blustering big mouth, uh, I'm somehow still not uh, that great at self-promotion. But uh, I will say that uh, a new issue of Eldritch Tales, edited by me, has come out and is available exclusively on Amazon. Uh, another issue of the Journal of Higher Criticism, same arrangement, uh, ought to be out very quickly with some interesting stuff, partly by me, partly by reputable scholars. Uh, and uh, I have a book coming out apparently very soon from Pitchstone Books uh, called um, Houses of the Holy, a uh, higher critical survey of the world religions. And I've been uh, really eager for that to come out. It's about 600 or so pages. And even at that, it's hardly as comprehensive as, as it should be with all those religions. I deal with a dozen of them. And uh, trying to get some ideas for a paper I've been invited to do for some uh, atheist conference, but I figured I've already beaten that to death. Uh, well, we'll see if I can think of anything. And uh, let's see, I got a few books waiting to get published uh, by me or somebody else, one called um, Not peace but a sword about the question of early christian pacifism whether there's any real basis for that and whether jesus if he existed was a zealot revolutionary and uh oh boy then uh, uh various other short ones uh that um uh I, I can't even think of them all offhand, but uh, there you go. if you keep looking on Amazon with my uh, name on them, you'll probably find something that I've forgotten already. You're so busy writing books and getting published. You're, you're forgetting how many, you know, are going to be published soon. That's yeah. a good thing. I wish I could write that well. <laughs> I'm just a one hit wonder. Just had my piece on the origin of evil and that's good enough for me. <laughs> hmm. All righty. Going into our first question. <laughs> So in Acts, the apostles are interrogated by the Sanhedrin, and eventually one of them states, For in fact in the city both Herod and Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. So the word here is prorizio, which means to predetermine, or, uh, you know, it could mean to causally determine or predestined. So the question is, did God causally determine or necessitate the murder of Jesus, or did the people who were responsible for his murder have libertarian free will, that is, the freedom to have done other than what they did? Um, so what is in the mindset of the person who wrote Acts? Did the people have libertarian free will who murdered Jesus, or are they predestined by prior causes to kill Jesus? I think it's... Um actually both. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, trying to bail the Bible out if it gets into, if it paints itself into a corner, but there are other statements in Luke and Acts that imply uh, Luke was thinking that a God uses the sins of uh, human beings to accomplish his will so that he's kind of outwitting them. They're no less guilty, but he knows better than they do what's going to happen and manages to weave it all together. Uh, it's well expressed way back in Genesis, where uh, in this great dramatic scene uh, in the story of Joseph, uh, he's now become the grand vizier of Egypt. His brothers 
uh, think he must be dead. They sold him into slavery years before. and uh, But it turns out through a series of Dickensian adventures, uh, he's, he's now become the, nearly the head of Egypt. And uh, he hosts them uh, at a banquet uh, when they've come to Egypt to get uh, grain during a famine. And they have no idea why and, and, and who this guy really is. And he says, well, look, I might as well tell you. I'm your brother Joseph, and they think, oh my God, uh, we're in for it now. And he says, hey, don't worry. Uh, you meant what you did for evil, but God meant it for good because that in inaugurated this chain of events that led to me being in the position to uh, manage famine relief for the whole inhabited world now. And so uh, all is forgiven. That seems to me to be the model in Luke. For instance, Jesus says uh, at the Last Supper uh, that he says, the Son of Man goes like to his fate as it is written of him. So it was prophesied and has to happen. But woe to the man by whom he goes. Uh, Judas, like he didn't know he was part of the prophetic plan. He didn't need to know it. He had his own venal reasons for it. Uh, but uh, God certainly knew that was happening and said, well, um, the Messiah has to, to die and rise. And that's big in Luke, uh, that uh, the, the Emmaus disciples, uh, they all, the last thing they knew was that Jesus was crucified and their hopes were dashed. We hope this guy would overthrow the Romans and all that, but obviously we backed the wrong horse. And they're, they don't know. Again, it's like the Genesis thing. They don't know they're talking to Jesus. Uh, and uh, he says, what's the matter with you guys? Didn't you know that, uh, that, that uh, someone couldn't be the Messiah unless they had gone through suffering and death? And then he shows them places which are not specified because you can't really find any uh, that say that uh, that uh, the Messiah was to die and rise. Holy mackerel. And then he vanishes. Well, that's the same sort of idea. It was prophesied. It had to happen, but it's the kind of thing nobody would have voluntarily done for uh, godly reasons. And, and again, in uh, Acts chapter two, uh, he says that... Uh, you tr tried to get rid of him, but God managed to to overrule you, but he used you. So he, he made a fool of these people, not by causing them to do evil, but by anticipating what they would do. It's sort of a complex thing. And uh, I, I think that uh, th that does raise huge questions metaphysically, but I don't think it's inconsistent. I think it actually fits right with Luke's idea of of prophecy and providence. He mm. he turns the wicked, the plans of the wicked against them and brings out his will. Yeah. But you know, if things have to happen like necessarily, that would debunk libertarian free will because libertarian free will is the position that in the same set of scenarios, you didn't have, even if you willingly did what you did, you didn't have to do what you could have willed otherwise. So if there's necessity, there can't be libertarian free will. So, I mean, do, so do you think that in the Bible, um, things are said to necessarily happen? Or do they just happen because people do evil, but they could have willed otherwise? But since they're doing evil, God's using that evil to, you know, bring about his purpose by, you know, punishing it or whatever. I think it's the latter because I, I don't really see fate uh, predestination as fate in the Bible, it seems to me that's uh, one of the many confusing results of trying to feed the Bible through the, the, the grid of, of uh, Greek philosophy. I think, uh, like, in the Bible, God can predict the future, but mainly does it in terms of ultimatums and warnings. If uh, if you don't uh, obey the covenant I made with your ancestors, there's going to be hell to pay. Now, you can repent or not, but I'll tell you what's going to happen if you don't. Well, God doesn't have, like, you know, Karnak the Great on Johnny Carson. He's not a clairvoyant. It's just that he can make what uh, something happen if he decides to, and no one can gainsay him. 
You can't stop God unless he says you can slam on the brakes. You don't have to be doomed. I'm telling you what to do to avoid it. It's up to you. And uh, I get the impression like it's not like the future is set in stone. It's just if God has decreed it, you're not going to be able to stop him. And so, um, but he... Um, I don't get the impression that there's a future set already, like St. Augustine would have said, because that springboards Augustine into the arms of a Hindu non-dualist Vedanta, saying that God is above the time stream. And if that's the case, you're talking about uh, God as Brahman and, and our world as a big illusion. Uh, and I don't think the Bible says that. And uh, I don't think Christian theologians think that, but that's the implication of what they're saying. So I think that's there isn't a problem, really, unless you read in Hellenistic metaphysics into the Bible. And of course, there's the question of, especially in the Old Testament, does it seem like an open theist position would be applicable? Because I know some open theists are like, you know, hey, you know, we're not a bunch of heretics, because sometimes in the Bible, it, uh, uh, you know, it you, when you read it, it gives the impression that God doesn't know the future exhaustively all the time. And then sometimes I think other critics who are against open theism might say, well, you know, if it seems like God doesn't really know the future, it's just he's just using anthropomorphic language. He's just talking in human mannerisms. But then the open theist will come back and say, well, I think sometimes, you know, the what you're interpreting as an anthropomorphism doesn't have to be interpreted as such. You know, they interpret it literally. And I think with some of the verses if you interpret it literally, it looks like God doesn't know the future exactly. He just knows like what might happen, but not like what definitely will happen. I mean, that's their position, at least from what I've read from Open Theist. What do you, what do you think about that position? I think they're more consistently biblical because when you start saying that, you're never going to be able to stop. And as Anselm already thought in what the uh, the 11th century or something, he he said that uh, well, you can't really say God loves us or God is mad at sin. These are human emotions uh, symbolizing something. Symbolizing what? I mean, it certainly seems to be saying this is how God is affected by our actions, that He's uh, we kindle his wrath and all that. It, that's just what, what they're saying with the anthropomorphic language or accommodationism, as Calvin called it. That's just a way of saying, well, we're free to disregard that. That's not what they mean, but that's the way it is with all allegory. You're just trying to make an inconvenient path passage into an acceptable one, even if you have to totally reverse what it means. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, what what does it mean when it says God repented that he had made the whole human race and he decided to flood them out and start over? Oh, uh, well, that's symbolic of what? I mean, it, 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 surely if words mean anything, you're saying, boy, what a mistake I made. Let me go back to the drawing what else can it mean? A symbolic of what? Uh, and, and this goes on and on. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Wait a minute. You're saying God is sitting in a chair and so is the risen Jesus. Uh, they both have butts that are resting on the cushion of a chair. Oh, no, no. that That's just symbolic of what? I mean, if you say it's not literal, I don't know what you're talking about anymore. Uh, it just seems to me uh, there's just no uh, no way to connect the two. You might as well be like an open theist and say, okay, the Bible is mythology, just like Zeus, but we believe in Zeus, uh, like it or lump it. Why don't they just say that? And the open theists at least are honest enough to... Uh, to be doing the, the, that, though they wouldn't put it the way I did. Yeah, and like the word repented, you know, it can mean repentance from evil, and that could also mean repentance, you know, in the sense that you wished you hadn't and done what you did. And that's yeah, all, that's all it needs to mean, and you're still yeah. in trouble. God yeah. didn't know what would happen? 
Oh, man, what was I thinking? God is saying this? Well, yeah, that's what they thought. They didn't think of that than which no greater can be conceived and the ground of being. No, that, that may be better than what they said, but that's not what they said. Yeah, you know, and then it's like, if there was a God that inspired this and he didn't want people to think that he actually regretted his decision, he wouldn't have inspired them to say that. Like the obvious yeah. implication from the people from the past are going to be like, hey, he didn't really know, you know, the world would be so evil. And if he did, you know, he would have done things differently. It's like, hey, this is going against my plan. I didn't foreknow that, you know, people would be so evil that I'd have to, you know, annihilate almost everyone except for, you know, eight people, you know. It's caught him mm -hmm. by surprise. I mean, what else, yeah. what else could it mean? You're right. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah. All righty. Uh, thanks for that commentary. All righty. And then going into, um, well, before we get into um, the Quran, we'll actually talk about our last topic related to the New Testament. Um, we'll just talk about one of the textual variants, because I know if I talk to you about the three major ones, you know, <laughs> I could take you like two hours. So we'll just talk about one textual variant from the New Testament, namely the woman who was caught in adultery. So tell us about the history of the manuscript traditions and why we have doubts about it being original to the New Testament. Well, it doesn't appear in uh, early the earliest copies of John that we have, and it does appear eventually in two different locations in the manuscript tradition of Luke. Uh, and and it uh, there are other reasons for thinking it doesn't quite fit. It's stylistically more like the synoptics than John anyway, which is means it it sort of made sense for somebody to say, I wonder if this was originally part of Luke. Uh, and so they they were on to something though they didn't know about the manuscript uh, differences. But there's uh, it seems real clear to uh, even to most evangelicals who will have footnotes in their bible that uh that somebody knew this story and said this is really great what it, it's not in the gospels well uh, let's supply that lack they might have thought maybe it must have been in one of them uh uh well uh, let's put it in where we think it fit best but apparently it it didn't uh, it's a good thing they preserved it it's a great story and in fact, we hear that in the gospel, according to the Hebrews, of which we have no extant copies, but we do have a lot of notes from church fathers who had copies, and they pointed out differences. Uh, and they said that in the gospel, according to the Hebrews, there's a story in which they drag before Jesus a woman who is guilty of many sins, and he forgives her. Well, that sounds like another version of it. Many sins or a big ticket sin. It almost didn't matter. But the point was, oh boy, she really had a rap sheet. But what a lesson of forgiveness. Jesus says, is anybody, is any of you uh, so morally? superior to her that you're in a position to judge her maybe you're next on the docket uh, it is a great story so they just figure like preachers sometimes say it ain't in the bible but it ought to be well what the heck let's add it uh yeah. so is it part of the bible uh that depends i mean you can ask the same question it's like uh, benjamin warfield said in the original autograph uh copies of the Bible, uh, that's where it was inerrant. If some jerk has added something uh, over the centuries, you don't need to worry about that. If there's a mistake there, eh, who cares? It's not really part of the Bible. Uh, who says it isn't? Because as Dewey Beagle himself, like I think an evangelical Methodist said, uh, what autographs are you talking about? The, these books were constantly uh, being added to. I mean, the mere fact that you have 66 books, they weren't all written at the same time by the same guy. I mean, it's a it's an accumulative thing. So uh, is that in the Bible? Well, I'd say, yes, it is. If you want to ask a more picky question, did the same evangelist who wrote the fourth gospel include this in it? No, apparently not. Uh, but uh, that so is it in the Bible? It just depends on where you're at and what you mean by the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, from a Christmas 
perspective because if Jesus didn't exist, like what would be your take on how the story originated with Jesus and the woman in adultery? Was it just a way to kind of like once he became, in your view, like historicized and people started to believe he was a flesh and blood human being on earth? Like was it just invented to make him, I know, I guess sympathetical or I guess consistent with more of the compassion and narratives we have in the New Testament or how, how do you think it came about? Yeah, at Bultmann suggested that many of these pronouncement stories where you have a brief lead-in narrative to make sense of a of an aphorism that's going to be the punchline uh, and that remains in your memory. He said he thought that uh sometimes the lead-in story as we read it doesn't exactly fit and he wonders if as with the quran by the way like how did they know anything about the the life of muhammad well they didn't know anything about it i mean even if he really existed nobody had any information by the time they're putting this book together and they decide they uh took passages from the quran and said now what could have led to this and there's the famous example that got Salman Rushdie into trouble, the satanic verses. Uh, we're told, I guess, in, oh, what's his name? Ibn Ishaq's uh, version of uh, the life of Muhammad, written about 100 years later, that uh, when Muhammad was negotiating with the elders of the Quraysh tribe in Mecca, uh, now he had them... Um, cornered and he said now we can have a peace treaty here but you're gonna have to embrace allah as the only god they had worshipped many different ones and they said well here's a counter proposal how about if we keep the three meccan uh goddesses alat al manat and al uzza um as as daughters and uh, of allah who can intercede with him uh, and we will get rid of the other ones. And Muhammad said, well, that sounds kind of reasonable. All right. Well, that night in his tent, the angel Gabriel came to him and said, are you out of your mind? Allah has no daughters. Uh, he begetteth not and is not begotten. And, uh, and then it says, Allah is able to abrogate any verse and replace it with one similar or better. Well, it was that last bit that must have led somebody to say, "What could have happened? Why, why would uh, that? Why would uh, Gabriel say that to Muhammad?" Well, maybe this happened. So the story was a clever way of explaining how on earth God could be telling Muhammad to cut out something he had thought was revealed. I think the same thing probably happened here. Uh, for instance, in Luke, uh, a a guy, um, his father has just died and his brother will not split the inheritance with him. So they bring it to Jesus since holy men were often appealed to as impartial mediators. And they say, tell my brother to divide the, the uh, inheritance with me. And Jesus said, hey, leave me out of this. Who made me an arbiter or an executor over you? Uh, which is sort of a surprise. Well, my guess is that somebody just had that statement, who made me an arbiter, etc. Now, that in turn is based on what um, they say to Moses way back in Exodus when he's in Egypt and uh, sees a guy, uh, two guys fighting and uh, kills the aggressor and then hides the body. Well, he thinks he's safe, but the next day, the, the, one of these guys sees Moses and says, hey, this guy's a murderer. Uh, and he said, uh, who made you a judge, a ruler over us? Well, it seems like, I said, well, geez, if Moses said it, Jesus could have said it. But then somebody said, well, why would he have said this if he did? Well, must be somebody approached him and asked him to, to give a ruling and he wouldn't do it. Um, but then somebody else, I'm guessing, uh, heard the saying without any context and said, well, I guess somebody must have brought a defendant before Jesus and said, okay, what do we do with her? And instead of the, the they expanded the original answer derived from Exodus and had him 
head him off at the pass in a different way. Well, uh, are any of you so morally superior that you ought to throw the first stone? If so, go ahead. Uh, it, it's the same basic punchline, but it's been reshaped. I mean, there's no way to know what happened, but but these are at least, I think, plausible speculations. Now, it could have been there was a Jesus, and he did say this, uh, though it would have been against the usual custom for a holy man to turn down a case like that. They usually did mediate such things, but uh, maybe it did happen. It's just that if there wasn't one, it's not that hard to explain where the saying came from, ultimately from Moses and Exodus, and, and then uh, diverging in different guesses as to what could have brought this on. Gotcha. All right. Interesting. Thank you for that. All righty. Now going into the topic of Islam. So in the Quran, it states, The hours draw near and the moon is split. Yet whenever they see a miracle, they turn away and say, Continuous magic, or an illusion in other words. They lied and follow their opinions, but everything has its time, and there came to them news containing a deterrent. Profound wisdom, but warnings are of no avail. So turn away from them. On the day when the caller calls to something terrible, their eyes humiliated, they will emerge from the graves as if they were swarming locusts. Scrambling towards the caller, the disbelievers will say, this is a difficult day. So the question is, how do you think this story of the moon splitting by Muhammad came to be recorded in the Quran? Uh, well, for one thing, uh, that imagery is so powerful that the dead, there's another one in the Quran where it says on that day, the dead will exit their graves as in a race. I I've always thought, boy, that is great. This is even better, like a swarm of locusts, the dead will rise. Wow. Uh, somebody had a vivid uh, image of this in mind. Uh I wonder what they meant by splitting the moon. Did Was it sort of like a Fatima thing where people claim to have seen the sun spinning? Um, maybe that was it. And who knows what brings that on? Or is it possible, not really knowing uh, the secrets of astronomy, that he's just talking about half moons? That the, the, there's a full moon and eventually there's just a half a moon and a sliver of the moon and then it's back. It's possible. That's all he meant. How does this happen? Like he elsewhere says, just look at the heavens. Doesn't like Paul says, doesn't that prove there's a God? Uh, that may be what he, he meant. I mean, people used to think an eclipse was a dragon eating the sun. Uh, and uh, this might be a variation on that. Like, how on earth is the moon cut in half and yet is restored? That's got to be a miracle. If you if you know that happens, why do you think a little thing in comparison or the resurrection of the dead is so outrageous? If it's God, all bets are off. Uh, so that would be my guess. He just means the restoration of the full moon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my take is it has to do with, um, and eventually this made this into the later Hadiths, where Muhammad was said to have, you know, supernaturally split the moon, and then when people came around him, they were just like, oh, he just did a magic trick, you know, it just seemed like it was supernatural, but it was just, you know, sleight of hand, so to speak. And I think the author of the Hadith got that from, um, you know, what was in the Quran, uh, you know, because I'm interpreting this as like Muhammad, like thinking he has to like do a miracle to prove himself. And then he finally gives a definitive proof. And then the scoffers just come and, you know, they continually scoff, kind of like what, what, what happened with Jesus. So like my opinion is um, I believe Muhammad existed. So I think um, like during his life, there were times where, you know, Jews and Christians, you know, he'd be dialoguing with them, and, like, they, you know, would not believe he is the prophet, you know, they'll be like, hey, you know, you're not in the, what we would refer to as the Old Testament, you're not in the old or new scriptures, you know, we don't have any reason to believe in you, and so since, you know, Muhammad wasn't, you know, specifically mentioned in the older New Testaments, 
I think he, I don't know if it was him or some other writer wrote down that, you know, Muhammad eventually split the moon. And I think it was just, uh, you know, to bring about like a greater proof because it's like, you know, all these prophets did miracles. Muhammad didn't do these miracles. And then, you know, in the Quran, it says like, you know, Muhammad was initially like, hey, you know, if I do these miracles, people are going to think, you know, I have the power of devils and they'll always find a reason to believe in me. I mean, they'll always, they'll always find a reason to disbelieve in me. So I think, you know, one of the assemblers of the, the Quran was just like, you know, if we just <laughs> invent, invent this miracle of Muhammad doing something like splitting the moon, that will show that he, you know, has the telltale sign of a prophet, and then people will accept them, so then they won't be like, oh, you know, he's not mentioned in the Older New Testament, so we'll just reject him. Like, oh, he did this miracle, you know, he clearly gave a supernatural token, so then we'll accept them as the prophet. That's how I think it like, came into play. <laughs> mm. How did they come up with such a... Uh such a miracle if it was just fabricated uh, i mean i can imagine people say i've never seen that yeah uh, it, 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 came, it came i would say that like i don't know exactly when the quran was written but it was written so long afterwards that they could have gotten away with it you know that's that's yeah. that, you know maybe you know that, that's mm. like, like what i'm thinking um yeah so that's just my yeah. opinion all right well, that was a good, uh, oh yeah, but you know, I really appreciated you bringing up those alternative explanations. I didn't think of that before, because you know, like, yeah, I think like, people back then, they're like, kind of like Monty Python level stupid, you know, because like, I could see them thinking like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know the moon spoke now, it's just darkened in that area. Hmm. That, that's a good, that's a good alternative explanation. All right, all righty, going into our last question. So, um, since there's been a lot of discussion about Islam these days, you know, you have like a lot of apologists like Muhammad Ajab and others like getting, you know, really popular on YouTube. So Islam has been a you know greater topic of discussion now and Christians and Muslims are dialoguing more and like having debates and stuff like that. So I thought I would talk about, you know, the primary text of Islam, the Quran. So, um, Without going into too much depth, um, how do you think the words of the Quran became assembled? Especially since, you know, you don't believe that, you know, Muhammad was a historical person. So what were the motives of the people who came up with the words in the Quran? And approximately when do you think, you know, they were written? Well, I, I don't know that there wasn't uh, a, a historical uh, Muhammad, though there are serious reasons to doubt it. Uh, and also, right in the middle of the options, there's the possibility that there was a Muhammad, but that his role was quite different, as um, Michael Cook and Patricia Crone have argued that uh, there's some early references to the kind of debates you mentioned, where it seems like uh, Muslims were saying that that Muhammad was a kind of John the Baptist figure promoting and, and heralding the coming of the Messiah, um, Umar, who, who then is later refashioned into the second of the caliphs. But uh, he was known as Umar al Farooq, which means Umar the Redeemer. And uh, that originally he was uh, the, the leader of the original understanding of the um, of the the uh, the hijra, the flight or the hijra um, that today in Islamic origins stories is said to be the escape of Muhammad from Mecca when the. Quraysh elders were seeking his life, and he had been invited to Medina to the north to take refuge there. So he did and got out by the skin of his teeth. And they say that was the flight. But uh, earlier references imply, no, the, the, uh, the Hegira was a movement of Jews and Arabs together uh, to liberate Jerusalem. They had to cross the, the, the Sinai Desert and so on, and uh, that this Messiah was, was leading it, and that uh, they succeeded. And, uh, but later on, they reshuffled the deck because they were trying to establish their identity as being part of the same tradition as Judaism, Samaritanism, and Christianity, 
not just an outgrowth or a version of one, but something like it, but with distinctives, because there are um, early statements that imply that Muslims believed in the saving death of Jesus on the cross, which they certainly don't believe in uh, in the Quran, uh, and uh, that uh, the, the Qibla, the direction of prayer, was um, in uh, Jerusalem, but then it was changed to Mecca. Uh, why is that? And that Mecca might originally been borrowed from the Beka Valley. And there's all sorts of weird things, like uh, the original name for Medina uh, was Yathrib, which reminds me a lot of Yithro, Jethro, the uh, father-in-law of Moses. But even um, Medina sounds like Midian, where Jethro lived. And some of the stuff sort of sounds borrowed from the Bible and just reshuffled a bit. Uh, and um, so this would have taken some time. And uh, the the dating kind of depends on how much you know about when Muhammad actually lived and what he did. But if most of his so-called biography is based on trying to deduce what might have led to this and that Quranic statement, you don't really have any evidence. And, and again, the surahs of the Quran often contradict one another. Uh, which is why you have this statement about abrogation of an earlier statement. Uh, and uh, they're so redundant that uh, you got to wonder, well, well, also, let me just jump to the last thing. Um, how did they say the stuff was preserved? They claimed that these are just the revelations, the, the sermons of Muhammad, and that people remembered them and later wrote them down on whatever scraps they had from the sh the uh, shoulder bones of sheep to uh, palm papyrus, uh, whatever, and uh, that uh, it took a long time. Well, there's no way you could get an accurate record of somebody's preaching that way. Who could remember it that well for any length of time? I mean, studies show that people can't remember things correctly 10 minutes later. Uh, there's just no way. And we do know, on the other hand, that uh, Muslim scholars constantly fabricated hadith. Uh, well, here's a story I heard from uh, Abdul al-Hazred, and he heard it from Karim Abdul-Jabbar, and he heard it from uh, Abdul uh, Gamal Nasser, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, the whole long chain to give it authenticity, but it's obvious th these things are fakes. It's impossible. But this was a way of saying, again, it ain't in the Quran, but it ought to be. Okay, it's not there. You, you, we finished the Quran, but darn it, some uh, of these ideas didn't make it in. So let's say they're based on people's recollections. Well, so happens. That's what they say about the, surah, the surahs of the Quran itself, that they were just various early followers remembered what he had said and wrote it down. There's no reason to believe any of it goes back to a single person. Uh, and there there are uh, anachronisms and uh, image, like uh, sea voyage images that come up a bit in landlocked uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, there's... Uh, references to trade that nobody that lived there would have known about. And it, it just seems like it the stuff came from who knows where in the early centuries and that they, a dim recollection of this survives in the story that um, Islamic theologians could not resolve debates because they would proof text the Quran, but the text each used was not the same as the other guys. Oh, it says right here, what are you talking about? I don't have that in my copy. And this was happening all over the place. So they uh, appealed to uh, the, I think the third Caliph Uthman and said, what do we do about this? And he said, I'll tell you what, send me all your copies and I will have a scholar um, 
harmonize them and uh, and get rid of the inconsistencies and so on. And then when they did, we'll replace your copies and burn your originals. Oh, well, that's great. Uh, and uh, that, to me, sort of implies that uh, that this was an attempt to create a unitary canonical text, uh, which again, just really wipes out any access we might have to hypothetical earlier versions. Uh, and that's just what you would need uh, to, to know what to do textual criticism. Uh, and one last uh, thing, uh, there are manifest signs as Gunter Luling discovered of uh, at least a third of the Quran being rewritten Arabic Christian hymns. Uh, and, and he showed in great detail in a, a book that I helped him polish in English uh, that, uh, yeah, you can uh, take this and that goof out and change this and that unintelligible word, and you got a statement about Christ the Redeemer, not about Muhammad and uh, uh, the uh, mouthpiece for Gabriel. And again and again, he shows this, and uh, he shows the genre of uh, lyric poetry in which the Quran is written didn't even exist in the time of Muhammad, if you look at contemporary writers. It's all anachronistic. So th this, you can lose your head literally in certain parts of the world for saying this. Uh, but now the floodgates have opened and there are all sorts of uh, higher critical revisionist theories, not among Muslims, of course, but among those who learn the language and the, the data and some great books are out. Yeah, because first it was popular amongst Muslim apologists to say every text off, you know, like, you know, legitimate, authentic translation of the Quran is going to be exactly the same, like word for word. And then that was shown, you know, with authentic, you know, translations to not be the truth. And then you have someone like Fraid saying, well, yeah, they're different, but they're just ways of saying the same thing. It's like one text said something like, you know, Allah is gracious. And then another text said like, Allah is merciful. Or so, so, oh, but then Fraid was like, oh, yeah, they're different words, but they're expressing the same idea. They're not contradicting each other. So even though it's not the exact same wording, it's still bringing yeah, but about that's the same idea. The beginning. Yeah. That, that's not really what critics are, are pointing to. Yeah, you know, that. well, that's how it was in the beginning. So it's like, okay, we'll admit it's not exactly word for word, but it brings about the same idea. And then, like, I think, you know, even that was challenged because um, I remember one of the the ex-Muslims was like, well, here's a sexual variant and another one. And the way Fraid tried to, like, resolve the situation by saying, oh, it's just another way of bringing about the same idea. That one actually, I think it was one of them, but it actually looked like a variant. So it was just like, eh. So even that's a little, you know, off too, yeah. And then, like, you know, in the Quran, like, you get this sense of, like, this, you know, this evolution of, like, apologetic. Because, like, in the beginning, you know, you have Muhammad saying things like, well, I'm not going to do miracles ever. Because, you know, if I do the miracles, people are going to think I did them from, de you know, did, got the power from demons. This looks like mm. someone just... This is plain magic. Re, re, yeah, recontextualize the story of Christ, like the story of Christ, because that's what happened with Christ. He's he's doing miracles by demons, but anyway. But then it's like now you have like Muhammad splitting the moon. Now it's like, oh wait, hold on. Like I thought people are gonna think you did it from devils. How come he he's not like do he's like he's now doing this miracle now? And then you even have like the. Um, you know, it's claimed that people passed by this and said it was like a an illusion or whatever. But then I think like even the later hadiths. There are miracle claims that are were supposed to occur after the splitting of the moon. Like he did some other ones, but those are in like later Adis. It's just like and that's it's just right. Like, yeah, and it's just it, it's just you know you can clearly see like things are just being embellished. You know, like you know, kind of like with like you know it, a, 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 any other really popular person of like ancient past, like you know with. Alexander the Great, you have miracles being, you know, ascribed to him. Of course, that happened like 400 years later. But it's like, you know, it's just like this typical, let's just embellish these prophets with miracles. And like the one telltale thing, like from the Quran that was like alarming was when it says in the Quran, it records this, uh, when Jesus turned uh, birds or turned stones into birds. And it's mm -hmm. just like, 
uh, you know, did it ever occur to him that, like, you know, that came from the Gospel of Thomas and, like, you know, he, like, the earliest manuscript of that probably came no later than, like, 150 AD, if not later, so this can't be as, you know, attributed to Thomas or even someone, like, you know, who knew Thomas, so you can't no. even say it's from the tradition, even according to Thomas, but, you know, Muhammad was just like, oh, like, Gospel of Thomas, like, it must be, like, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like, written in the first century by, you know, probably Thomas, you know, the apostle, or someone who knew him, but, like, he didn't know about the, the you know, the text tradition coming so late, you know, it's just, like, things like that, and... Yeah, he probably only heard that story that was still circulating by itself because it looks like the infancy gospel of Thomas and other similar ones were just collections of wild stories about Jesus the menace. You know, what was uh, the, the almighty brat doing? Uh, and they're humorous, though we don't know if they took them as jokes or not. Um, but uh, it's, it's obvious that's all. Or how about... Uh, uh, their version of the Last Supper, where Jesus proves his divinity or whatever by, um, I think they say, the disciples ask him, can you cause a lot to bring down a laden table from heaven? And he says, why, sure, and then does it. And so the table loaded with food for the Last Supper descends from heaven. Obviously, somebody has heard the saying from the Gospel of John, uh, I will give you the true bread from heaven. Uh, and, uh, well, there was a supper, right? And so that must have been the occasion. Uh, nope. Uh, and it's obvious that they didn't even have copies of the Bible. I mean, they don't uh, even pretend they did. Uh, and uh, they that's why they make such a big deal in the Quran about saying God has at last given the Arabs their own scripture in their own language. He gave uh, the Injil, the gospel, to Jesus, as if Jesus actually went around with a copy of the New Testament or something. He gave the, the, the Psalms to David and the Torah to Moses, as if that's the whole Bible. Uh, they they didn't have copies of it. So uh, what did they know about it? Uh, they, they weren't stupid, just ignorant. And uh, and uh, so the, the fact that things appear in the Quran as if from the Bible uh, just shows, no, nope, sorry, uh, that's, uh, or they claim that the text was altered so that when Jesus in the Gospel of John predicts the paraclete, uh, the the uh, companion, the uh, advocate, uh, the attorney, it means a lot of different things, that, uh, oh, no, no, uh, that was uh, not uh, paracletos, but pericletos, uh, a different Greek word that means uh, the uh, the illustrious one, which happens to be what Muhammad means in Arabic. But what somebody doesn't understand the language because you could make parakletos into pedikletos if you say the vowel points weren't originally there, just the consonants. Well, that's true about... Um, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, etc., but it's not true about Greek. They had actual vowels, so somebody has mixed them up to make that claim, and uh, it's it's just demonstrably not true. We have actual copies of the Gospels hundreds of years earlier than Muhammad was supposed to have lived. So uh, what, do they know the future, and so we better change this, because one day Muhammad's going to come. Uh, yeah. Well, so I always say, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to believe. Yeah, there you go. Amen, yeah. And you know, like, one of the craziest things in the Quran is where it says that um, Allah uses the luminaries. Some readings have the stars, other, like, you know, variants have, like, the luminaries or whatever illumines the sky. He utilizes the luminaries to punish demons in outer space. And then one of the authentic Qurans further edifies this for us and says that in particular the solar flares of the stars which are used in outer space to punish demons. So they it's just like you know, the writers or, or, or you know Muhammad and the writers of the Hadith imagine Allah just in outer space and there are these demons flying around and, and they wind like, up and then whammo purpose of them shooting is simply to punish demons. 
demons. Like, I don't know why he can't just kill the demons or, or you know, use his psychic powers to, like, harm them in any way to, or, you know, so they won't throw out his purposes. I don't think there's like, have to use so specifically the solar flares of meteors to punish demons. He's just about to tell them, like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Incoming. Uh, it, it's like, uh, like in Genesis, these are uh, what's called... Uh, well, etiological myths, like, uh, what the heck is the rainbow? Uh, and they, well, they see it when it's, uh, stop, the rain is stopping. Well, maybe that was the war bow of Yahweh, the storm god, and he put it in the sky to say, I'm hanging up my weapons, I won't destroy the world with a flood again. Yeah. Uh, the Babylonian said, oh, that's the necklace of Ishtar that she put there as a pledge that she won't flood the world. They weren't stupid. They were quite imaginative, but they had no way of knowing what really happened. Well, my guess, these guys saw shooting stars and said, what's going on there? Uh, well, it must be Allah, you know, was winding up and letting it fly to get the demon. I've got another one. Uh, it's, they're not stupid, but, you know, they were using their imagination. Uh, so I don't yeah. mean to ridicule these poor people, but uh, it's actually a sign of their intelligence. But, of course, it's not true. Uh, and uh, if you are stubbornly refuse to admit that it's not, now you're being stupid. Uh, my honor, you the writers are going to deep figure this out. Like, yeah, is this... It looks like, you know, myth and just like Arabic myth, and they're just like yes. using that as the basis of how to do science. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's the <laughs> tragedy of it. You wonder why they've been mired in, in pre-scientific superstition for so long? Because of that! Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. Wow. All righty. Well, good stuff, and once again, that was another fabulous interview. All oh, right. It was fun. <laughs> I know, oh, so much fun. All righty. And you know the drill in a couple of minutes. I'll give you the link and share it with friends and family. And Terrific. once again, thank you for the interview today and hope you have a rest of a blessed day today. You betcha. You too. See ya.